So it's the last talk of today. Uh, things that I'm doing are related to minimal surfaces, but I'm not going to talk about minimal surfaces. Here's what I want to start. Um, I want to start with two motivating, two motivating questions um, that are a little bit vague, but I'm going to give examples right away to clarify what I mean. So the first one is the following. Can a given combinatorial structure on a topological space determine a rigid geometry? So think about the, the combinatorial structure, for instance, as a triangulation. The second one, if one varies the combinatorial structure, so think about the case where the combinatorial structure that you start with is a triangulation, think about refining the triangulation. For instance, that's a one example. Can you obtain some analytic structure or analytic information about the space? Okay, so, so these are two vague questions, and these are two good motivating questions because there are interesting cases in which both answers are yes. So here is one classical example. It has to do with the convergence of the Riemann mapping, um, and it took the ingenuity of Thurston in 1985 to even conjecture that. So is it clear at the end? Is the picture clear at the end? Clear at the end? Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to go off my computer to a bigger transparency, but if people want to see the bigger, a bigger picture, a more detailed picture, then I, you can come and see later. So here, here's what we are doing. So think about, think about the, the image in the right-hand side, and let's call it omega. That's a simply connected um, open domain in the plan. And think about your favorite cookies, and what you do is you pack this domain with cookies in, in the way that some combinatorics is preserved. And the combinatorics is the, in this case, is the hexagonal combinatorics. That is, for every cookie, you have six neighbors that are tangent to it. Six and no more and no less. Okay, so you do that. So what? So now there is an error going from that unit disk with two to our cookie. Okay? And what is, what is here? Well, the unit disk doesn't need an explanation. Well, what do I see over here? What I see over here is a big black box, which is called the kobe andreev thurston theorem. And the kobe andreev thurston theorem is telling you the following. You look, look again at the right. The right has some combinatoric, combinatorics, which is determined by the packing. And the kobe andreev thurston theorem tells you where there is a packing of the unit disk, which is what you see here on the left, by circles which preserve the combinatorics. So of course the radii of the disk in, in the left are not going to be preserved in general, but the combinatorics is preserved. So if you look at the contact graph of what you have in the left, of the packing in the left, and the, you have the contact graph that you have in the right, they are isomorphic. These are all induced by um, graphs in which each vertex has exactly six, six neighbors. That's what it is. Okay, so the big black box is is the fact that we can have such a packing that preserve the combinatoric of the unit disk. Now, what is, this, what is this arrow over here? This arrow over here is a map. How is that map built? This map is built in the most trivial way that you can think about. So if you have three circles here, one, two, and three that are tangent, and you know the images in the hexagonal packing is right here, then you also know where the centers are going. A, B, C, A tilde, B tilde, C tilde. So you know that the disks, where the disks are going, you know where the centers are going. So now do the obvious thing, just complete it to a triangle in the range, in the domain and in the range, and extend the map that you have from the centers to an affine map on each triangle. Okay, so do it for all the triangles in the right, and that you get yourself and extend that to a piecewise FI map, and you get yourself a piecewise FI map from here to here. Okay, let me be more precise. What does here to here ma mean? When I look at the packing here, think about it, and that's the way Thurston think about it, thought about it as a cookie cutter. So the boundary of omega is like a cookie cutter, which cut some of the cookies. Some of the cookies are going to be inside, some of the cookies are going to be outside, if you think about an infinite packing of the complex plan, and some of them are going to be a little bit in and a little bit out, okay? 
So think just about the cookies that are inside. If you look then at the, at the contact graph of them and the support of the contact graph, this is a complex. So to that complex, we associate the Kobe andrea thurston packing. And hence, when we build this map, we get a map which is in supported on, on the packing in the left into the complex which is on the right. Okay, so now I hear that there are budget cuts in, in friends. So now imagine that instead of taking cookies of radius one, you just take cookies of radius half. Is that okay, Gerard? But I'll take many more, all right? So now repeat the process. So you pick omega with your cookies. Some are in, some are out, some are a little bit in, a little bit out. You use the black box, which is the Kobe Andrea Thurston theorem, and you repeat that little construction with FI maps and piecewise FI maps, and you, like, you get yourself another map going from the unit disk or the interior di unit disk into the complex in the right. Now do it to infinity. So make more, I don't want to say anything, but don't have more budget cuts, but you just go with this process to infinity. And Thurston conjecture, and it was his beautiful insight, that that sequence of maps that you are getting converges uniformly on compact subset of the disk to the Riemann mapping. Now, I'm doing a little bit cheating because I said D Riemann mapping. There isn't a D Riemann mapping until I do some normalization. That has to do with the little two disk over here. And it's a classical fact that the Riemann mapping is determined why once I pick an image of a point and the argument um, and the argument. Okay, but that's the whole idea and it works. Okay, <laughs> but this is an example to our motivating question. We have a topological space right here, right here on the right. We have a combinatorial structure on it which is induced by the triangulation, that's the contact graph. And by a big black, black box, which is the Andreev, the Kobe Andrea Thurston theorem, we are able to find another space, a model space, with a packing, a rigid packing, and an analytic map at the end of the day, not at ever any finite step, but at the end of the day, which we get just from starting with a triangulation. All right, so, so, so that, that's, that's a little bit of a motivation. Now, Rodin and Sullivan very quickly, I mean, two years later, uh, proved Thurston's conjecture, and they are important and beautiful extensions ever since by, for instance, and this is by no means, this is not an exhaustive list, by Aronov, by Phil Bowers, by Dubensko, by, of course, Schramm and Hare that, that took the whole thing upside down and proved much stronger theorems and not just for the hexagonal packing. Um, and they also analyzed the derivative of the Riemann mapping using circle packing by Stephenson, Bidon and Stephenson together, by Verdier, who is not here, but he's in, from Grenoble, by Feng Lu, who is present here, by Chow and Lu. Um, so, so Lu and Chow and Lu, um, Lu by himself and Chow, Chow and Lu analyze or use uh, circle packing on surfaces to try to approximate, for example, Ricci flow or the Amabi flow. There are contributions by Hardell, by Gu, by Lu again, Xi, Yao and Gu. Uh, these quarters, this list of quarters, uh, contributed a lot to the theory of computer vision using circle packing and PL metrics on surfaces. Uh, there is Williams and the list, the list is still uh, going on. So what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about a, a different thing. I'm going to talk about a conjecture which was made by, in the 90s by Stephenson. Stephenson was desperate to give, I wouldn't say desperate, but he was, he was really in a competition with Trem and Ha to, to give a, a proof of the Riemann mapping um, of, of Thurston conjecture, and here is what he did. Um, and that goes back to Riemann. So imagine that you have this, uh, and, I, and I'm going to drop the simply connected case for a second, but I'm going to go to it at the end because that's just a consequence of our work. But imagine that I have the next topological object, which is just a planar annulus. So Riemann said the following here, like the one on, on the board. So how do you uniformize an analyst? Okay, that's a, that's a pretty legitimate question. So Riemann said the following. He said, consider that plan analyst is made of, of, is made of a uniform conducting metal um, plate. And when you apply voltage, say one here and zero here, currents flow through this, this plate. And what you get is you get 
X family of equipotential lines, they are foliating the annulus, and they go all the way from level 1 to level 0, which is here. Okay, so where are the currents? The current is what flows in, in that system, and the system of current again foliates the annulus, but this time the lines are going from one boundary component to the other, and together the system of coordinates, coordinates like, can make, um, can make this analog in, into, into a circular one or into a concentric analog. So together, the uniformization theorem of an analog is projected by uh, Riemann will give you a concentric analog. Or if you want a cylinder. So it's really reasonable to conjecture, and, and I met Stephenson, that's how he thought about it, that um, the behavior of that electrical system, right? This, so this is going to be our uniformizing map, which we, what we are looking for, F conformal. So it is reasonable to conjecture that if you make two approximations, two approximations, one is you approximate the shape of the analogs. If I approximate, approximate by what? I'm, I'm going to approximate it by a system, by networks, okay? Which I'm going to explain in a second, but think about it as just triangulations with extra structure. So first, it's reasonable to believe that I need to approximate the analogs, but then uh, in, in a reasonable way. So that corresponds to refining triangulations more and more. But then each triangulation will give me like a finite, will give me a finite network. The question is, when I have a finite network, just the, the one that you build when, when we were six years old or eight years old, when we put conductance on edges, the f even though we, s we put the same potential on the two boundaries, when you change the conductance, we change the current. So the question that Stephenson uh, raised in the 90s, which, which fascinated me, was um, for a little bit, what is the right conductance that we need to choose on the edges so that when we run this electrical system approximation, that means approximating the shape of the analogs and choosing conductance rightly, we're going to get the conformal map. So that was his conjecture. And Stephenson, what he really had in mind is some in intricate quantities of hyperbolic radius and angle. And in fact, it boils down to this picture. And that's why I was so fascinated about that, that conjecture. So look at this picture, and we'll go back to the circle packing. What we see in this picture, we see the blue circle, and we see, and we see the red circle. So just imagine right now, for the sake of this, this, this talk, that, that the contact graph that we have is indeed a triangulation. Okay? So that means that we're going to have two circles, the green ones that are tangent, one from here and one from here, and no more. Okay, that's what I have, and that's what I'm going to work with. Just bare hands. So, so what do I have else? I have the distance between the centers. This is ZV, and ZV is the center of, of that circle. And I have Z, ZU here, and I have ZV, the center of this circle. Everybody's OK? And then I have these two circles, the green and the green. OK? Well, these have a different role. What you see over here in the black point and the black points is the center of the circle that is orthogonal to the three. OK, there is only one. So one circle, blue circle, green circle, and you see the dotted purple circle, which is orthogonal to the three. It has a center. Here, here is the picture on the other side. Red circle, blue circle, green circle. Here is the center of the circle that is orthogonal to the three. What do I have? I have the distance between the centers, and I have the distance between these two centers of the circles that are orthogonal to the tree. Here's the conjecture. The conjecture is, and we can go all the way over here, I just explained to you this paragraph, the conjecture is, if you approximate the analogs appropriately by a system of networks, and you have to approximate the shape, I mean, there is no way that just with a finite network, one finite network, you can get the conformal mapping. But if you keep get, refining your, your networks, which, which means keep refining your triangulation, 
And each time you do this, this computation, say in the circle packing or, or say in just in trunk, you can do it for any triangulation with special properties that I'm going to mention later. But for the sake of simplicity, just think about the one that comes from this packing. Then these are the conductances that you have to choose. And that was his conjecture in, that was raised in the 90s. So um, there is some very interesting probabilistic uh, explanation to why he, he thought about it. It turns out, let me just, just very briefly say, when you do packing, it turns out that there are, uh, say, think about that center. That center has an angle around it. Okay? And as you do packing and you try to pack in the most primitive way, after a certain step, you're going to, unless you're very lucky, you're going to come and, and, and hit yourself or intersect yourself. So you need to adjust the radius. So it turns out that when you adjust the, the, the radius, say you increase the radius starting from ZU, it turns out that you decrease, in, increase the angle around that vertex and decrease the angle around the neighboring vertices. Altogether, you say, so what? Altogether, since we are doing here, uh, you know, we are dealing here with Euclidean triangles, the sum of the angles has to be pi. So that means that no angle is lost. Speaking about probability, this is called a Markov process. And the probabilities that are coming from, uh, from Stephenson's conjecture are really related to the derivative of the angles. OK, but that's not the way I'm going to solve it. Actually, I'm going to, that's not the way we're going to solve it. I'm just going to ignore all of that. I just wanted to share with you where he came from. So uh, what I'm going to do is really bare hands, <coughs> and it comes down to a very simple uh, observation. So what we do in general is construct special type of flat surfaces starting with combinatorial topological data. The, the, the topological data is just a bounded M-connected planar Jordan domain. Um, it's ended with a triangulation. Uh, the triangulation has to be nice enough in a way that I'm going to explain a little bit later. Um, and the map from the domain to its target has nice properties. And nice properties in, in my line of business means that I want the map to be conformal. No more, no less. I want it to be conformal. Okay? So what's the one my main underlying idea that, that if you come out of this talk is, is just a very basic fact that if you take a conform analytic, analytic map, which is defined on the whole complex plan, you can write it as a sum of two functions, okay, u plus iv, okay, and Cauchy-Riemann equations tells you, tell you that u and v are each, each one of them is harmonic, but furthermore that v is the conjugate harmonic to u, okay. So our idea was to just drop, and if you go to the proof of um, Thurston uh, wrote in Sullivan, there is a lot of machinery of quasi-conformal maps. Uh, what we decided to do is instead of looking at limits of quasi-conformal maps, I'm going to search for two harmonic functions, two discrete harmonic functions, and I'm going to show that these two functions converge to what I need. And what I need is the conformal map of the analysis. So it looks like kind of weird. Why would you look for two functions instead of one? Well, that's what we decided to do. And second of all, it's not enough to have these two functions harmonic. Okay? They have to be conjugate. V has to be the conjugate of U. So that's the second idea. And the obstacle is, just to tell you the end of the story, basically, uh, the problem is that none of these functions that we are going to build in this talk is actually going to be harmonic. It's going to be also almost harmonic, what, what we call asymptotically harmonic. But at the end of the day, everything converges. Okay? So we can rest um, for a little bit. Here's the theorem. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna mention the theorem and the rest of the talk I'm gonna to tell you about what are the, the properties that are coming into, into, into this theorem and say just a little bit about the convergence. Nothing here is really scary other, other than the fact that it's long. But okay, that's life. So let Tn be a sequence of quasi-uniform triangulations of A. Quasi-uniform means, I can quantify that, means that you don't have really skinny triangles in your sequence. Skinny triangles kills the subject because of many reasons, but they, they are not going to be skinny. They are going to be fat enough in a way that we can quantify. A is a polygonal planar annulus of mass size 
um, uh, the message has to do with the triangulation. You want the diameter of the triangulation to go to zero. You can expect going to have a good approximation if one of your triangle sticks out there with, with area two. Okay? You want that to be chopped too, and that's what we do. So that's the mesh size. A is polygonal for the sake of this discussion. In fact, our theorem is much stronger. It has, we can do that for any, 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 any analysis which has um, C0 boundary. And furthermore, um, our techniques work for multi-connected domains, planar domains as well. But let's stick with one. So think about the triangulation. Well, the triangulation has edges. And I just told you how to put the conductance on each edge. That's according to the Stephenson RCP. Now we had a function gn, which is composed of two functions, un tilde plus pi n of h tilde. OK, gn is going to approximate. So look back at this, at this function. GN is going to approximate a function, a smooth function, which satisfy delta U equals zero. Okay? So U is smooth and harmonic inside the analysis, and U restricted to E1, this is the outer boundary, is one, and U restricted to E0 is zero. Okay? So this is smooth. Okay? That's the function. Gn, which is composed of two, two discrete functions, is going to approximate the smooth one, un. Okay? That's the analog of our uh, potentials. That's about it. Now, what are the conclusions? Well, of course, I haven't explained how to build them, but what are the conclusions? First of all, as n goes to infinity, in the, as n goes to infinity, the L infinity norm of Gn and u, the smooth function that I'm looking for in, in a way that I explained, in a second, goes to zero. Second, on each compact proper subset of A, the GN are not. This GN are going to be discrete object, but they are not harmonic in a way that I'm going to explain in a second. They are symptotically harmonic, and I can say exactly what the order. The order is three. But now, so this is technical. But now, here is here is what the action come. The GN star, the GN star, GN tilde star denote the combinatorial conjugate of the GN. So to each gn, I'm going to associate a conjugate function, okay? just like I have in the cauchy riemann equation. But these are going to be discrete functions. And altogether, this function, phi and v, so this is defined on each vertex, which is x 2 pi over the period of gn star times gn v plus i gn star v, where v is here, this sequence of map, and this sequence of map you still don't know what is gn. You still don't know what is gn star. But you do know that you've just defined here a complex function, a complex function on the vertices. Okay? Period is some combinatorial invariant that we are going to associate to the conjugate function. Okay? And this is a function which is defined on the vertices. So the end of the story is that this function, this sequence of function, up to normalization, of course, converge uniformly on compact subset of A to a conformal homeomorphism. To conform your homomorphism where? Onto Euclidean analysis EA, where the inner and outer radius are, are given by R1, R2 is 1. So this is going to be R1 is 1. And R2 is given by that number. So what is 2 pi? I don't have to introduce. What is period if you star? Remember. U is harmonic, is a smooth harmonic. So to U, we can associate the conjugate harmonic, U star, and then I can look at the period of U star. Okay? So where am I cheating? Um, I'm not cheating a whole lot. I'm just cheating because um, when I say a harmonic conjugate, there isn't really harmonic conjugate. How do you get harmonic conjugate? Well, in the smooth category, and that's what we are going to do discreetly with a couple of modifications, you pick a point in your analysis, you pick a curve, and you want to understand what's the value of the harmonic conjugate at another point here, say P. So you connect them by a piecewise smooth path, and then U star at the point P is the integral of the normal derivative along that path. Let's call it gamma plus u star 
at that point, let's call it x0, y0. Okay, so do we know harmonic conjugate in reality? Of course we know. If you look at the plan, then ur theta equals log r and vr theta equals theta are two harmonic functions and theta is the harmonic conjugate of log r. But there, here's the cheat right there. Theta is defined only up to mod 2 pi. So everything that we're going to do has to, uh, the ambiguity has to be co come here when we are going to talk about periods. That's the theorem, okay? So a little bit um, of, of, of definition. So when you, when you have a graph, um, uh, so, say you take any multi-connected domain and it's triangulated, what you can look at, you can look at discrete um, boundary values on the graph. So, so what are you doing? You take a triangulation, you in invoke any conductance constant or any conductance function on, on the edges. So that means you don't pick the particular one that Stephenson had in mind. You just pick any positive constant on the conductance. And what you want, you want it to be symmetric, and you make that into a finite network. Now, when you look, when you look at such a combination, what turns out to be important is the vertices that are located on the topological boundary of your domain, so on the red part and on the blue part. Okay? So this is what we call vertices that are on the topological boundary is delta v, and some edges are also unique. Some edges can feel what's happening on the boundary. This is e, e bar, okay? There are edges that are completely in the interior, and there are edges that have only one vertex on the boundary, so this is E bar. So now the Laplacian, the discrete Laplacian of such a function is defined as the weighted average of, this, of, of the difference between ux and uy, where if you are standing at a point here, you just look at all the neighbors, including the one on the boundary, you check what is the conductance on each edge, and you look at that sum, okay? So that's the average, uh, averaging. And of course, when you are at the boundary, and you want to talk about the Laplacian on the boundary, you can't, because you, know, you don't have vertices on the outside, <coughs> but you can talk about the normal derivative <coughs> of of the function near the vertex, and what you do, you just restrict the Laplacian to vertices that are inside. So each vertex on the boundary is going to have two vertices that are neighbors. You don't put them in that sum. Okay? So that's what we call the normal derivative of a function. And again, it's just a discrete object. So what's the big deal here? The big deal here is now we're going to look at some functions which are interesting. And a function, a positive function on V star, on V bar, that's the vertices in the interior union, the vertices on the boundary, is called harmonic if the Laplacian at each vertex is zero. So you go back, and this is just a linear check. You, you stand at the vertex, you check the average, the, the average, the arithmetic average, weighted with the conductances, and you check whether or not this is zero. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, our life are not going to be easier because the functions that we're going to deal with at the end of the day are not harmonic. They are almost harmonic in the way that we can quantify. Okay, and of course you have an energy, um, which is the Riemannian analog of an energy. When you take an energy, you just take the sum of the conductances and you took ux minus uy square because ux minus uy is the discrete primitive analog of a gradient. Okay, and that's, that's how you get the energy of a function, and furthermore, furthermore that whole, that's called the Dirichlet energy of, of u. And now here's a, here's a definition theorem. So what is it good for? I'm going to show you first application of what that kind of machinery leads to. So give me a positive constant. It is known that you can solve the, di the discrete Dirichlet boundary value problem. How do you solve it? You specify that the values of the function that you're looking for on the vertex boundary, the, outside, the outer vertex boundary is one. And the values on the inner boundary components, and we have three here, are zero. And you also want the Laplacian at each point, at each interior vertex, to be zero. And I remind you, that Laplacian is conductance dependent, okay? Depending. When I change the conductance, that operator is changing, okay? But so far, I'm just not picking any particular conductances, and I'm asking myself, what can I do with this? 
So let me show you what you can do with that. And all of this data, you have a fixed triangulation. We don't refine anything. We pick a K. Here's a theorem. So um, that theorem was first uh, proved by four others, which I'm going to mention in a second. Book, Smith, Tone, and Tweet. It was reproved by uh, Cannon, and Floyd, and Perry in 1996. It was reproved in a different way by uh, Benjamin and Shami in 1996. Um, it was proved by us, with, again, with a completely different proof in 2012. And it says the following. It's, it's maybe a first step that one can think about. It's a discrete uniformization of an analysis. It says the following. And this is also su already surprising because it shows you what you can do with really primitive tools. So pick an analysis and, and pick a positive constant. And now I'm going to define to you a straight cylinder. A, the straight cylinder is exa has exactly height, which is k. Okay. And it has, so that's not hard. It has height, which is k. And it has circumference c, which I'm going to write here, sigma dg over dn c, when c is in E1. Okay. Well, this is the normal derivative, which I just defined before. So I, I just gave you a model. Okay. The model is given by solving the Dirichlet problem, the discrete Dirichlet problem. Okay. And here it is. It's just staring to, to you at the face. So now, now what? Then there exists a mapping f which associates <coughs> to each edge in T1 in your triangulation a unique embedded Euclidean triangle in the cylinder in such a way that the collection of these rectangles form a tiling of the cylinder. And furthermore, we are looking for f with good properties. What's known about this f in this case, f is energy preserving. So that means, what is energy preserving? The only reasonable thing to look here is the area of the cylinder, which it can, we can compute. And the only thing which we have on the domain is the energy of the boundary value problem, where they are the same. Okay? So that's the theorem, basically. That's, that's a warm-up of the theorem. Here's how it goes. Well, you go over, here's, here's a schematic formulation of the triangulation. You start with the vertex on the boundary, x1. And since this is planar, you have a notion of going from left to right. So I'm picking, I'm picking x1, I'm picking one vertex, and I'm checking what's the difference in the function values, right? The, the Dirichlet problem between gx1 minus gy1, okay? That's a number, okay? That's going to be the height of the green line that you see over here. What's going to be the circumference? What's going to be the circumference of that? That it's not exactly a circumference, right? It's the, the width of that tile that I'm going to attach to the cylinder. That's going to be the conductance along that edge, which I have because I just, I just specified it, times again gx1 minus gy1. Okay. So I just specified to you what is exactly the dimension of that tile. Well, then I go to x1, y2, <coughs> and I do the same thing. What is gx1 minus gy2? That's the height of this tile. What's the length of that arc? That's the conductance cx1, y2 times gx1 minus gy2. I do this one by one till I go to the last, the last neighbor of x1. And I'm finishing right there somewhere over here. Okay, what do I do next? Well, I go to x2 and I repeat the construction. And this is how I get, I go all over e1 and this is exactly the number that I wrote over here. That's a circumference. Okay. So by construction, you see that I have attached tiles, which are Euclidean tiles, up to mapping them to the plan, and they do not overlap. Okay. They do not overlap. And furthermore, I don't have any gaps in my construction because that's how exactly how I choose C, to be the sum of all of them. Okay, so that's step, step one. And if you're interested to know why you can go on consistently with all of this construction and you can tile the whole cylinder and why you don't have holes, then you need to read the paper. But, uh, or you may want to read the paper, but th that's just, just an example. And, and we can do that, or actually we did that for any multi-connected domain. And using some topological result, the Hopper-Muntag for surfaces with boundary, we actually did it for any 
closed surface. So whenever you give me a closed surface with a triangulation, I can cook to you a flat surface with conical singularities. These are going to be multiple of 2 pi with tiling like this. Uh, that has also appeared, recently appeared. Okay. End of the day, this is what I get from step one. Here's an honest to go triangulation. Okay. Uh, we just did our programs. We just threw on some vertices. We solved the Dirichlet problem and then we tile. Okay. Not a cylinder, but an analus. So I tile by analus shells and I try to tell Mathematica to do every shell with a different color, but this is just the first step. Okay. So altogether, um, what's the problem? This is all very nice, but this is nothing. Uh, actually, by, actually, and very importantly, the first person to start this line of argument was then in 1903. And, and then there is a pretty nice history um, and hopefully some future. But um, the main problem, of course, is that F is not a homeomorphism. F is built from taking edges to, to, to tires. So uh, the idea to make this F conformant um, looks pretty hopeless. So, um, I'm, I'm going to skip the, 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 the very interesting theory here. Um, uh, by the way, the four people are booked, just to mention the name, are Brock, Smith, Stone, and Tuit. Um, it goes back to correspondence that they build between square tiling uh, of rectangles and multi-edges, uh, multi-graphs ended with, with two poles, a source and a sink. Uh, one direction of the paper is very precise. The other direction, they are very honest and they are writing that that they are writing um, just a sketch. And, and these, these people, Cannon, Floyd, and Perry, Benjamin, and Schramm, all different proofs, and, and ourselves attack that question again. And um, I think it's tight. Oh, OK, Canyon is also involved in this story by tiling by polygons. Um, and at a certain point, Schramm, Schramm, Cannon, Floyd, and Perry dropped this issue of uh, networks and, and did these things with, with notions of discrete extrema length. But that's a, re uh, a topic for maybe a different lecture. OK, well, how do we prove the difference in conjecture? Back to reality. So, so this is nice. It, it finishes, at least nice for us, finishes the program that Dan started. But we want a conformal map. Okay? And first, I'm going to do it for an analyst. I'm going to tell you how I do it for an analyst. To go from an analyst to the RIMA mapping is an exercise. To go from an analyst to multi-connected domain takes some doing. Okay. Um, but let's focus about the analogs. Um, why do we care about analogs? Because if you know how to read modulus of analogs, then you can control quasi-conformal maps or you can control conformality. So go back to our, our triangulation. So, so here, here is what we have. So take G, any, any, any reasonable s solution of a Dirichlet problem that is defined on the triangulation. And now, Extend, so, so G is defined on vertices, so extend it affinely over triangles and look at the level curves of G. So if you just stare at that, so, so this is an honest to God program and, and which gives you the, the level curves to a certain degree and, and extend them all over the place. So if you just look at that and you forget the triangulation, then y you can see that the level curves of G, whatever the Euclid problem we solve, really look like PL foliation of the analogs. And in fact, we're going to show that these are really, they are really approximating U, which is log R, the harmonic function that we are looking for. This is the, for the harmonic function, not the conjugate. The conjugate is a whole different story. But that, that's really promising. But the question is, well, how do you find a new function, which is D star, the conjugate? How do you find that? Well. So here, reality strikes. Not only the G is not, G and N are not going to be so harmonic, these ones are not going to be harmonic too. <coughs> but I'm going to imitate, to tell you what's going on, I'm going to imitate that construction that I just did here. I use inter line integrals. Okay? I use line integrals to recover G st U star. So I'm if I have G and I'm going to use level curves, PL level curves, that's why I present them here, for G. Well, that doesn't work. We need to look at, stare at this picture a little bit more. But um, G star, just as U star, is actually multi-valued. And it's called the conjugate function of <coughs> G, mod periods. And it obtained by integrating the discrete normal derivative of G in a particular way. So unfortunately, just looking at tri triangulation didn't work. We have to introduce a new 
a new player in the game. The new player is, is obtained the following. Is obtained as follows. Look at each triangle. So all the triangles <coughs> are going to be the way Geneve likes them. They're going to be <coughs> acute. <coughs> and in each triangle, I'm looking at the perpendicular bisector. And I'm continuing the process. So, so he, here is just a, a star of one vertex. <coughs> here are the CT, which are the centers of these perpendicular bisectors. And now I just continue the process, OK, from a triangle to a triangle. So what I get at the end of the day, if I stand at the vertex, I get a cell. OK? So these are, going, these are, call, these are called volume cells or Voronei cells. Okay? <coughs> to each one of these cells, there are two quantities. I can look at each one of this perpendicular bisector. And, and at that moment, that should ring a bell for you with the Stephenson conjecture, because this is what's coming into the picture. That length between the center of the circles over here divided by that length, which is the distance between the vertices. Okay, that should ring a bell at this moment. And now, there's two quantities for each vertex. One is the maximum of the, the Euclidean length of each one of them. And given a finite triangulation, look at the maximum of all triangles or all cells. Okay, so these are two quantities. All right, so this is just quantities. And now, so you sit down and you draw a little bit of pictures. And here, what you see, here's a piece. So this is a piece of a triangulation, and here are two cells that I just obtained by looking at the duals in a particular way. And here is a curve, the brown curve is a nice curve enclosing these two. Well, and I want to do this, okay? And I want to do this. The question is how to do this right. And how to do this right is it means how to do it so that, so that it converges. Well, first problem, the function that, that we are dealing with are not harmonic. They are only asymptotically harmonic. So, but this is in a way which is per scale. So, so if these functions that we are building are going to be were harmonic, this was zero. Okay? But it turns out that reality strikes, and it's not zero. It's almost zero in that sense. There is lambda, which is the quantity of, of the cellular decomposition. And the Laplacian at each vertex go, it goes to zero as that goes to zero. And this is the order of how fast it goes to zero. But how do you choose, um, how, how, do you, how do you do, since I have five minutes, how do you do, um, no more, almost 10, right? Almost seven. Oh, I have more. Seven. You stop me when I need to. OK, so, so here, here's what I do. In order to define the conjugate function, Okay, so think about G as a solution of a Dirichlet problem, okay, which we define. In order to define the conjugate function, I'm not working with the vertices of the triangulation. It just doesn't work. What I'm doing, I'm picking a vertex on the Voronoi cells. Here it is, W0. And I want to define to you what is the value. Here it is. Just pick it once and, one and four. And just I want to define for you what is the value of the conjugate function here at W. So I choose a path going from W0 to W. And this path is al along the boundary of the Voronoi cells. Now look, again, I'm using the fact that it's planar. On each one of these edges, here is the first edge, I can talk about right or left. That's only what I, would, what I can see. So there's going to be one vertex of the triangulation, which is to my right. I go to that edge. And again, there is left or right. So there is going to be one vertex from the triangulation, which is from my right. And so on and so forth, up until I go to the last edge, going from here to here. And that's the vertex that I see from my right. So I have a path on the Voronoi cell. And I have another friendly path, which I call the flux fellow path. We just follow it. OK? Everybody's clear with the construction? Now, the point is, why do I do that? For these vertices, W0, W1, W2, the normal derivative of the function doesn't make sense because the function is defined on the vertices of the triangulation, not of on the Voronoi cell. But here, once I do my flux fellow path, I can look at the normal derivative, which is just going to be the, the difference between here, the, of the function between this vertex and this vertex, the function between this vertex, which is on my right, and this, this vertex and this vertex between this vertex and this vertex. That's my normal derivative now. And it's well defined after I choose a path. 
That's what I call the flux fellow path. And along that path, I'm computing the analog of that line integral, which is the normal derivative, and that's how I get the function. Okay, so there are a lot of things to check here. Like, why is, why, how does it depend on the path, the path on the Voronoi cell? And if I, took, if I take two paths going one from here to here, or one from here to here, or one which is making, giving me a simply connected domain, what is the effect on the function? Okay, so all of that is checked. And it turns out to be not too bad in the sense that if G is harmonic, my function was harmonic, that would be zero. If it's not harmonic, as, as reality tells us, it's going to go to zero at the limit as I refine my triangulation. Okay? So, that, that, that's the, so this is what I said. Now I have, I've, I've told you how to define um, the, the normal function or the, the, the conjugate function to G. And I'm telling you what's the period. What's the period? The period is, is just do a whole path, a whole closed loop. Going from here, fix your point, do the whole thing. And that gives you the period, okay? So these are the quantities. And I go back, these are the quantities that appear in the theorem. And I go back to, to the proof. So what we have to prove really <coughs> We have to prove that the GNs, these were, these were our discrete approximate to the function U, converge to in the L infinity norm. And we have to prove that the GN star, the discrete conjugate functions that we are building, converge to U star. That's the computation, basically. That's why they go to, to infinity. Instead of uh, giving you a five minute uh, hard analysis um, explanation, I'm just going to draw you a picture to convince you why this is true. So this is true because if you have a polygon, just a polygon, and you have a function, and you want to measure, you want to do integral of the function, and a smooth function, just a smooth function, you want to measure what this is gamma, what's the u over the n ds. To first approximation, you just look at u, say this is x and this is y. You look at just uy minus ux divided by the distance, right? So this is the, the denominator that appeared in Stephenson's um, conductance, the x minus y, the distance between x minus y. Okay, that's the first approximation for the gradient. But now, <coughs> this is the gradient here. But you need to estimate what is the whole total est or integral along that edge. Okay? So you do ds, so that's how the length of that piece will come into the picture. And so this is going to be the length of gamma, which are the mij or the cij. And this factors is exactly the conductance that we did in the Stephenson conjecture. So where am I cheating? I'm cheating because this was true if u was an affine function. So that, now you basically do just Taylor computation and you see that if u is smooth enough, then this quantity will really approximate that line integral up to some order which can be uniformly controlled. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, if you go back to, to, to the theorem, oops. Just a second. I'm done in exactly one minute. If you go back to, to the theorem, right? I have one minute. If you go back to the theorem, um, the hard part, the hard analytic part is this one. These GNs are actually composed of two discrete functions, not just one, and they are not discrete harmonic. Once you have the convergence of these functions, and this is a result, basically a pretty recent result by Lazaro from 2004, guaranteeing the L infinity result, we will be able to, to finish the rest of the argument, and that gives the uniformizing map of analogs. And I'm done. <laughs>